Welcome to another edition of Inside Medicine. I'm your host, Doug Geinzer, the CEO of Las Vegas Heals. Heals being an acronym for Health, Education, Advocacy, and Leadership of Southern Nevada. We like to bring in leaders to of healthcare in Las Vegas right here to the studio every Thursday at 10 o'clock and talk about good things that are going on in healthcare in Las Vegas. Whether that's expanding medical education, bringing medical travelers to town, doing new innovations, or sometimes even legislative matters. But catch us here every Thursday at 10 o'clock. If you do happen to miss us, you could go to our website and you could catch it there. You could go to YouTube. You could go to Stitcher, uh, Roku, Spotify, all different types of plays. But we're here in the studio today. We've got a different uh, layout. We've got two guests here today. So we're going to do one episode and then we're going to do a little commercial break and then we'll come back to another guest. But our first guest in the studio today is Joe Ferreira uh, from the Nevada Donor Network. Joe, welcome to the studio. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah. So you've been the president of Nevada Donor Network for just a couple years, but wow, what a transformational change. And we want to talk to you a little bit about that today. Sounds great. So tell us a little bit about Nevada Donor Network. What's your mission? What do you do? So at Nevada Donor Network, we are the federally designated nonprofit um, who coordinates organ, eye, and tissue donation in in pretty much the entire state of Nevada. And we are responsible for taking those gifts uh, bestowed by heroic donors who have passed and their families, and uh, we get them to the transplant recipients who are waiting for those very, very important gifts. And so one of the things that amazes me every time I hear it, you are, and Las Vegas is, the top procurer of organs in the world. That's correct. Yeah, we, um, through our cultural transformation that we underwent since 2012, uh, we've uh, set about to become the most productive organ recovery agency Um, And we currently lead the, not just the nation, but the world uh, in the number of donors and organs transplanted per capita. Uh, And there's also a more specific measure that uh, relates to in-hospital deaths um, that occur here in the the valley and throughout the state. And we've been able to procure more organs uh, from those heroic donors um, based on per 10,000 deaths. Uh, higher than anybody, not just in the country, but in the world. So it was great. I watched, uh, there's a lot of media coverage recently about the teenager that uh, unfortunately lost his life uh, a couple weeks back, and they did a um, a salute in the hallway as he was taken down the hallway. That was uh, very emotional for a lot of people. It is, and it, it really uh, speaks to the heroism of organ, tissue, and eye donation. Uh, we regard these heroes as... Um, very important members of our society who have made the decision in this particular young man, uh, despite the tragedy that befell him and his family, made the very mature, uh, honorable decision to become a donor um, in uh, when he was uh, getting his license. Uh, and in his case, it was his motorcycle license. And so despite that being such a sad and tragic case, we were able to honor him uh, at UMC, our uh, major local hospital, with an honor walk. And these honor walks really um, get a lot of um, attention because they they show that being an organ, eye, and tissue donor is honorable. And in your last hour, you're able to leave that legacy on behalf of you and your family. And, and that's just such a powerful thing, especially to the recipients who are waiting. So... This is a unique position. How did you get involved in organ procurement, organ donating? How did, how did that come about? Yeah. So it's a, it's an interesting story. My father is a physician still practicing at the age of 80, uh, delivering babies and uh, doing surgery in in the South Florida area. And so when I was in college uh, getting my undergraduate degree, I decided I was going to follow in his footsteps. So um, I, finished my undergraduate degree, was studying for the MCAT. And because I hadn't had a hospital type job, I decided I was going to get a job while I was studying for the MCAT. And so uh, I was able to uh, secure a position as an orderly in the operating room of the hospital where my father practiced. And it just so happened about a year into that job, while still preparing to go to medical school or apply to medical school, 
uh, the University of Miami's organ recovery team came into the hospital in the operating room to do an organ recovery. And so I was able to set up the room, observe the procedure, be involved in some aspects of the procedure. And from that moment on, I was captivated by the heroism of the donor um, that passed away and uh, the recipients that that person was going to literally save from the brink of death. And, you know, that really transformed my perspective in healthcare and wanting to do good by uh, being involved with organizations like that. So uh, that was about 21 years ago, and I haven't looked back ever since. That's awesome. And you just led the Nevada Donor Network team through a transformational change. What what does that mean? What what was involved in that process? Yeah, so one of the predicaments that we had here in the state um, through the Nevada Donor Network was uh, back in 2011, we uh, fell short of a lot of the regulatory aspects that are expected of us, and we were underperforming as an organization. So when I was offered the opportunity to come lead the organization, I immediately recognized that the systematic failures of the organization were related to the culture and and not being connected with the rest of the country and the world in terms of best practices. So uh, with the team, we set about uh, doing a cultural transformation, but we did it in a unique way that follows a lot of the models in business, uh, in successful businesses, and we mimicked some of those very important cultural aspects that you need in an organization to allow a very healthy environment. So uh, in many uh, cases, there are smart organizations that have good systems, good practices, but they may or may not be a healthy organization in terms of supporting their team and putting the team members first and um, thereby allowing them or freeing them to be able to provide the best service to the people that we serve. And so we set about changing the cultural aspects of how we treat the community, how we treat those that we interact with, because we're a very community-based organization. And so we rely on those community partnerships to be able to help us. But we first had to focus on our team and creating a healthy team culture. Once we were able to do that, our team was more um, able to serve our community partners and the people that we serve in terms of the heroic donors, the donor families, and the recipients who are waiting. So we started out in our own house taking care of the team, and we created an environment that allows everybody to be successful. And by doing that, we recruited a lot of talent from around the country that wanted to be a part of that. So we, we tend to think of ourselves as an entrepreneurial style nonprofit that invests in community partnerships, invests in the missions of our community partners to ensure that they're successful while they're helping us be successful. It's been amazing watching the transformation because I've been in town for 26 years. I'm an organ donor myself. Uh, and to watch where you were as an organization many years back to where you are today, two different organizations. So kudos to you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And there's many of folks that benefit from your services throughout the community. How do they benefit? Talk, us, talk to us a little bit about that. So as I mentioned uh, a bit ago, we uh, take the position that it's not uh, just important for people to help us execute on our mission. We provide value to the community partners that we come into contact with uh, to also ensure that they're successful in their mission. And so the community at large benefits from our presence in the community because we invest in those partnerships to make sure that the community services are uh, bolstered to the point where we are have a part in ensuring their success. Um, and so it's, it's a two-way support in our case um, based on being an entrepreneurial style organization. So in that respect, the, any community partners that we come into contact with, because we ensure that they are also successful in their mission and invest by sponsoring in events or um, collaborating with them in events that they care about, we feel like that helps the community at large. And then there's the obvious benefit 
to people who are waiting for those vital organs and tissues and ocular grafts to restore sight. Um, we have a direct effect on how productive we are, as we mentioned earlier, to be able to get as many of those gifts to the people who are waiting, not just here in the state, uh, but also around the country and in some respects all over the world. And so the community at large benefits by our presence because uh, we are the only designated organization to be able to recover organs within most of the state. And we also recover tissue and, and ocular grafts um, that there are people in our community here in Nevada who have received some of those pre precious gifts. And, you know, by that token, we, um, they wouldn't be able to receive those gifts if we did not exist. So how does one become an organ donor? What's that process look like? So, you know, traditionally in the past, most people associate becoming an organ and tissue and eye donor uh, at the DMV uh, when they register for their license or renew their license or get an ID card. That's the perfect opportunity for you to make the designation or the selection to be a hero and become an organ, tissue, and eye donor. Uh, these days, because of technology and some of the things that we're able to leverage in terms of marketing and getting the word out and dispelling some of the myths that are out there, um, you can also do it online. So the DMV being the primary source where we get most registration still today is the, the most obvious one. Uh, but you can also register on the national registry and you can get there by going to our website which is www.nvdonor.org and that will route you to the national registry where you can electronically register to be a potential donor so i know i tell everybody that i'm an organ donor how important is that to the process and uh, how important is it to share with your family that you really want to. Yeah, so you bring up a very important point. We encourage everyone that registers uh, to make their wishes known to their family because when it comes time, um, unfortunately, when bad things happen and you're not able to communicate with your family, it's important for them to know what your wishes were so that it alleviates them of the decision or having the um, emotional distress of making the decision on your behalf. So um, if you make your wishes known to your family before something bad happens, it believe it or not, we hear from donor families often that they wished they would have talked about it with their family members so that they would have been able to know what the right decision was by their loved one. And so registering as a donor alleviates your family of having to wonder or take the um, the pressure of having to make that decision on your behalf. So we encourage people to not just register, but actually talk to your family and friends about it so that uh, if in the event you're in that position, that uh, the process will be a lot smoother and it'll be a less of an emotional toll on the family. So what type of organs and tissues are procured? What type of organs and tissues get donated? So it depends on the circumstances around uh, the passing of the person, but primarily in organ donation, um, one of the things people don't know is, uh, again, one of the myths that exists out there that if, if something happens to you, the medical team and the healthcare team is not going to try to save you because they know you're a potential donor. Uh, so the reality is you actually have to make it to the hospital with the heartbeat uh, you have to have a blood pressure, and that's the only way if you're mechanically supported on a ventilator so that they can evaluate whether you have brain activity. Uh, they have to literally throw all their resources at you to be able to try to save you first. And if in the event throughout the course of that they uh, are not able to save you, then we start evaluating for potential organ donation, but you have to have a heartbeat you have to have a pulse, you have to be on a ventilator, and at that point you're eligible to donate heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, uh, and in some cases intestines, uh, pancreas to resolve um, some patients that might be diabetic. And so, so there are up to eight organs that somebody can donate and save up to eight people if you're in the organ donation category. 
The other category, obviously, is tissue donation. And uh, you can impact the lives of 80 people just through your tissue donation because it involves skin for burn victims, uh, tendons for sports injuries, uh, people that need bone implants because they've either had a very aggressive bone cancer to restore the structure to their limbs. Uh, these days, we also do hand transplants for people that have lost their hands for whatever reason uh, and other appendages. And so the, the science is advancing to a point where more and more things can be transplanted to save more and more people and restore their quality of life. So one particular donor can impact up to 100 people um, under the right circumstances. So I've got one more question, then we've got to bring this part of the episode to an end. Um, what's your vision for Nevada? What does that look like? So I'm glad you asked me that question because we're currently, given our success on the organ donation side of things and our profile in the community and what we've done to invest in the community, we now want to try to be a part of the solution to get more Nevadans transplanted here in the state. Uh, currently, UMC is a, is a great center for kidney transplant, and they can provide a kidney transplant for people. Uh, but if you need any other organ, you have to go to another state to obtain that transplant, which I think is unconscionable. We yeah. need to have more robust transplant services here. And Nevada Donor Network has set out on a, a long-term strategic plan to be a part of that solution and invest in that solution for the state. Well, I think we're going to have to do a whole other episode on just that. But for now, we've got to bring this part of it to a close. Joe, I want to thank you for being on Inside Medicine. And uh, for our viewers out there and our listeners, we're going to have to take a quick commercial break while we change the set and get Dr. Dan Burkhead, the incoming president or the current president of the Clark County Medical Society, who is our next guest on Inside Medicine. Joe, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to the next time. Join Las Vegas Heels as we celebrate the Inspired Excellence in Healthcare Awards on Thursday, October 24th, 2019. Las Vegas Heels will return to the magnificent Four Seasons Hotel to recognize and celebrate six more honorees. Be sure to save that date again, Thursday, October 24th, and be on the lookout for your personal invitation. If you know a physician or healthcare leader worthy of recognition, consider nomination. Nominations open on May 31st. We look forward to seeing everyone at the Inspired Excellence in Healthcare Awards on Thursday, October 24th, 2019. Next guest, Dr. Dan Burkhead, the president of the Clark County Medical Society. Dr. Burkhead, welcome to the studio. Thank you, Doug. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, well, we want to learn a little bit more about you. You're recently installed as the newest president of CCMS. And, but before we get into that, I want to know about you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, uh, sure. So I came to Las Vegas in uh, 1999. I've been here almost 20 years now. Um, I grew up in the Midwest and if you were to ask me 25 years ago, what's the least likely town I might end up practicing I in? I think we were all there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, very quickly after visiting Las Vegas, I just fell in love with the, uh, with the town with, uh, from, from the excitement of the strip to the wonderful outdoors areas with Red Rock Canyon and Mount Charleston. Uh, the town offers so many great opportunities and I very rapidly learned that, uh, despite what some of the rumors have been in the past. Um, Las Vegas has an outstanding medical community, and uh, they're some of the best uh, providers that I've ever come across in my life right here in town. And you're a pain management doc. Uh, I run several clinics in town, and you just recently took on this role of president of the Clark County Medical Society. That's correct. You've got a lot going on. I do have a lot going on. Um, 
fortunately, my uh, pain management clinics have uh, have gotten to a level of success that I can uh, have a little bit more time for other matters. I'm I'm uh, serving. Uh, still a clinical role in uh, in the pain management centers and in innovative pain care center. Um, but I also have a lot of administrative duties now, and that afforded me some time to take on this role as the president of Clark County Medical Societies. I think that it's a very, very important organization. It's huge. It's important that we have an advocacy group for our physicians here in town. Tell us a little bit about CCMS. Give us the broad scope of it. Sure. Clark County Medical Society is a membership organization, professional membership organization, uh, comprised of physicians, medical students, medical residents, uh, medical fellows here in, uh, in Southern Nevada, as well as physician assistants. Um, we basically provide uh, value to, to our, our local physicians and patients uh, through advocacy, through community outreach, and through special programming. And you were recently installed. It was an amazing, beautiful event. Uh, thank you, the Bellagio. I was there, and it was a... Uh, it was great watching you get uh, sworn in as the newest president, and here's your fellow board members. I think we've got uh, a photo of you getting sworn in by uh, the past president, so congratulations. Well, thank you. Yes, it was uh, it was wonderful to see you there and to see John Burke and other uh, uh, members of Heels, and I'm and I'm very um, very happy to uh, to have this partnership with Las Vegas Heels. I think that. Uh, that we are in alignment with uh, with what we see for the future of uh, medicine in Clark County, and uh, and it's very exciting to have this upcoming year. Um, Dr. Roth did an incredible job he as did. president last year. He uh, he took on a number of great roles, and he really teed things up very nicely for me to come on in and move forward and uh, implement a lot of the programming that uh, that we want to get through this year. Uh, we've got some exciting things on on the docket for uh, for this upcoming year, and, and I expect that we're just going to continue to grow. Yeah, so when physicians and medical students and fellows join the medical society, what are their benefits? What Why, why do they join and what do they get for it? So I think the most important thing that we provide for our physician members and, and uh, medical student and medical resident members is a seat at the table. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Howard Barron often uh, uses this quote. He says, if, uh, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and, and I think that, uh, that that's a very appropriate quote. And um, I got involved in Clark County Medical Society back in 2002 when there were challenges legislatively to the practice of medicine in Southern Nevada. Um, I know you've been here. Uh, you, you, you lived through the Coden days. Oh, yeah. <laughs> keep our doctors in Nevada uh, where malpractice rates and, and uh, frivolous malpractice suits had re literally driven many subspecialists out of town. And I, uh, having established a, a new practice at that time, a relatively new practice, I was very concerned about uh, what was going on in the in the uh, legislative climate in medicine? So I got involved in Clark County Medical Society, and I've been getting more actively involved ever since. Um, so, in addition to having representation at both the uh, local, uh, state, and even the federal level through our recommendations to the AMA to to represent federally. Um, we also provide uh, a lot of outreach programs uh, for uh, physicians, um, different types of mixers, and, and mm -hmm. often co-sponsored by Las Vegas Heels, and uh, <laughs> we're always happy to, to join forces with those kind of things. Um, and uh, continuing medical education uh, opportunities. Uh, there are just a multitude of things that uh, Clark County Medical Society offers for physicians, but the most important thing, and, and it doesn't really matter if you're a solo practitioner, if you're a part of a large group practice, uh, the benefits are there uh, to be represented, to have your voice heard as a physician. And it's very important that, uh, that physicians do get more involved. There's strength in numbers. We're better together. And if we don't have uh, involvement of our physicians, not only by just joining up as members, but also by coming to meetings and being, uh, being uh, involved and participating fully. Um, if we don't have that support, then we have a weaker voice. 
think you're being very humble about your involvement. I'm looking at your profile here, and let's the Governor's Committee on Opioid Abuse Prevention, the DEA, the Attorney General's Working Group, the Southern Nevada Opioid Advisory Council. You're on the NMSA Governmental Affairs Committee. You teach at all of the schools. You're in clinical faculty of all of the medical schools here in town. Uh, And most recently, the Department of Health and Human Services Special Advisor for Public Health Policy and Practice. It's a lot of advocacy. Yes, I've uh, I've tried to get myself more involved over the most recent years. Uh, with uh, as as most of us know, the, uh, the the recent opioid bill that was passed, not this last legislative session, but the previous one, uh, AB four seventy four, um, was uh, somewhat threatening to uh, many physicians that uh, that prescribe opioids to their patients for uh, pain management purposes. And um, it required a lot of working through and a lot of uh, there was a lot of education that needed to be provided to physicians regarding the, um, the circumstances of that bill. So that's sort of how I, uh, I kind of got springboarded into <laughs> all of these other activities. Yeah. So we got a lot of AB 474 cleaned up this past session, which was critical uh, to the profession. What else was addressed in this last legislative session? I know we're still digesting it because it's 120 days of madness. Uh, but what else was addressed in this last session? This last legislative session actually uh, saw a numerous, numerous uh, bills that were potentially threatening to the peaceful practice of medicine in Nevada. Um, So Clark County Medical Society teamed up with Nevada State Medical Association and uh, through the great advocacy of folks like Kat O'Mara, who was up there lobbying every day during the Kat's session. Kat's a rock star. <laughs> she does an amazing job. Um, through through the help of, uh, of, of these organizations and through the opinions of the physicians that we serve, um, we were able to push back on a lot of different uh, threats to the practice of medicine. The uh, uh, what they call the surprise billing uh, oh, yeah. law, which, <laughs> which we humbly refer to as the surprise, I don't have the appropriate insurance law. <laughs> um, but uh, that that did serve to, uh, did serve as a, as a pretty major threat to the practice, especially in the emergency rooms across uh, Nevada. And we were able to temper what they could have uh, come up with for that for that bill. As you mentioned, uh, we, we worked hard to um, sort of uh, make AB 474 a little more reasonable for certain practitioners. Uh, so we the uh, bill AB 239 came up and it tempered that AB 474 and gave really some exceptions for certain types of practices, oncology, cancer pain, uh, palliative care, and hospice care being, being some of those. So, you know, you're a physician advocacy group, but the community at large benefits from this. Tell us a little bit about that. And I know you've got uh, a website that allows the community to find doctors. So tell us a little bit more about how the general community benefits. That's right. Uh, Clark County Medical Society serves to benefit the community at large. Uh, by offering uh, advice on uh, finding physicians. We, we can place people with uh, certain physicians uh, and of certain subspecialties that might be difficult to find. Uh, you can find us on the website at www.clarkcountymedical.org. And uh, we'd be happy to help uh, the community in general. Now, one of the more important ways that we, we help the community, in addition to keeping people informed as to uh, outbreaks of you know, any communicable diseases, um, immunizations, uh, and various other uh, public outreach uh, networking. Uh, But one of the most important things I think that we offer is uh, we are constantly trying to combat the issues that we have in Southern Nevada of a shortage of physicians. Um, Right now in Southern Nevada, if we were to meet the national standard, the national average for the number of physicians per capita, we would have to add at least, uh, actually more than 2,500 physicians wow. to our workforce, which is about a, over 150% increase in the number of physicians we currently have here. That's a big problem for the community. When you can't find a subspecialist and you have to you know, r- reach out to the surrounding areas, that's, uh, that's not what we want uh, Southern Nevada Medicine to, to portray. 
So we are working hard to develop uh, fellowship programs of different subspecialty areas that might be underserved in Southern Nevada so that when physicians graduate from our great new medical schools and our, and our uh, already established medical schools, whether it's uh, UNLV, New School of Medicine, or whether it's Toro University, and hopefully soon the new Roseman University will be, uh, will be providing uh, medical grads as well. Um, when they graduate, they have to do a residency and then oftentimes a subspecialty fellowship. Graduating from medical school in Las Vegas, fantastic. But if they have to move away to do their residency, then chances are they're not going to as readily return to Las Vegas as they would if we could offer the residencies here. So we're working to, to develop the, um, uh, the, the graduate medical education courses. It's critical as we bring on what I call real academic medicine in Las Vegas. Uh, CCMS plays such a critical role with onboarding these students and really showing them what it's like to be a doctor and providing them the support to be successful in their practices. Um, Unfortunately, our show is coming to an end. Uh, But just as with Joe, I think we've got a whole other episode, so we'd like to invite you back and have you as a guest again in the future. And I think we could take a subject and probably spend another 15 minutes on just that subject. I think we just scratched the surface on what Clark County Medical Society can do for the physicians in the community, the patients, and the community at large. Uh, There's so much more that I wanted to tell you, so I'd be happy to come back anytime. Dr. Dan Burkhead, thank you for being on the show, and uh, welcome to uh, the Clark County Medical Society as the newest president, and we will definitely have you back on the show again. Uh, For our viewers out there, and we hate to do this, but we've got to bring this episode to a close, but we will see you back here on the set next Thursday at 10 o'clock for another edition of of Inside Medicine.